Hi, welcome to Design Spark Ask the Expert. Today we're talking to Rome and we're going to be talking silicon carbide power devices. Thank you. My name is Christian Felgemacher. I'm a field application engineer with Rome specifically for power devices, silicon carbide, as well as our IGBT and Superjunction MOSFET portfolio. And thanks for having me. Let's get to the questions. Well, basically, the difference in material um, allows us to develop um, MOSFETs, so unipolar devices in higher voltage ratings. So whereas in the silicon uh, world, MOSFETs and also superjunction MOSFETs are typically limited to breakdown voltages of 900 volts or thereabouts, uh, we can extend this significantly with silicon carbide as a material for MOSFETs up to 3.3 kV or even above. And this is a voltage range where in the silicon world uh, the traditional device would be the IGBT, which is a bipolar device uh, which has very good conduction behavior, but uh, which always first of all has an on-state voltage drop which cannot be avoided due to the internal PN junction and also which has um, higher switching losses than a MOSFET due to the recombination at turn-off leading to tail current. Um, and therefore with silicon carbide MOSFETs the switching frequency in these higher voltage devices can be significantly increased. Um, mainly the difference is uh, the way the um, semiconductor is formed in terms of this underlying structure. In silicon carbide, vertical devices, very similar to what we already know from the silicon world, are being manufactured, uh, whereas in gallium nitride, lateral devices such as high electron mobility transistors are being built and um, so far available devices in gallium nitride are available in, for example, the low voltage region up to 100 or 200 volts and also in 650 volts, whereas silicon carbide devices address 650 volts and above, so also 1200 volts, 1700 volt, and maybe in the future even more. This is a difficult question because it always depends on what the system you are designing uh, needs to optimize for. But I would say that uh, any application where size, weight and volume constraints are very uh, important would be key applications to use the high switching speed and also low switching loss capability of silicon carbide MOSFETs. One example I could think of would be, for example, onboard chargers for electric vehicles because you need to fit them into certain volume and you need to make sure they have sufficiently high efficiency so you're able to cool them as well. Um, but other applications where the use of silicon carbide diodes and increasingly also MOSFETs um, is very interesting is, for example, uh, photovoltaic inverters. Today we have of course silicon carbide Schottky barrier diodes. These have been available for, for quite some years now and increasingly more and more manufacturers also have silicon carbide MOSFETs in mass production. We at Rome have two different generations of silicon carbide MOSFETs in the market as um, planar MOSFETs, which are our second generation devices, as well as trench devices uh, labeled as third generation devices and both offer very high performance in the 650 and 1200 volt class and we also have some devices available in mass production today up to 1700 volt. Um, not necessarily. Also we see in, for example, as I mentioned previously, in onboard chargers for electric vehicles, even at smaller powers, silicon carbide Schottky barrier diodes are commonly used. Uh, of course, if you go to higher power, then the MOSFETs are also um, very popular choices. Other applications can be single-phase uh, PFCs for switched mode power supplies, where um, silicon carbide devices can offer the potential to move to topologies such as totem pole PFC, which is very difficult to realize with a silicon device. Yes, today if you compare, for example, a 1200 volt IGBT with a certain current rating with a 1200 volt silicon carbide MOSFET with a similar current rating, you will notice that there is a price difference. 
parts of this price difference are of course attributed to the general newness of the technology. There's still a learning curve of course. However, um, also the underlying material is quite different. Silicon wafers are grown to sizes of 8 or up to 12 inches today in very large ignots from the molten phase. Whereas the growth of silicon carbide wafer material is much more energy intensive and also much more complex. These are grown from the vapor phase in very specialized reactors, which requires a substantial investment to build, but also operating costs in terms of energy. So I do expect in the future, of course, that there will be cost reductions with silicon carbide, but whether the cost will be one-on-one -on -one with silicon, that um, I, I would not dare to predict. Um, however, we always need to consider that the cost of the device is only part of the cost of the system. And if we look at the overall system cost and if the benefits of silicon carbide material and devices are fully exploited, then even today it is possible to build uh, power converters based on silicon carbide which are cost competitive or even outperform silicon based design in terms of costs. Well, this comes back to the difference in device structures. So in silicon, if we consider, for example, the 1200 volt class, in high power applications we use IGBTs. These are bipolar devices and switching on and switching off especially um, is limited in terms of the switching speed, primarily at turn off because of the tail current there are always um, some losses that need to be considered. Silicon carbide MOSFETs switch much faster. Of course, they're not lossless devices, but the switching losses are significantly lower. So um, in terms of operating differences, the DVDT and DIDT that can be realized is higher than with IGBTs. And this leads to um, special care that needs to be taken in the layout of the power PCB, for example, to make sure that voltage overshoots are contained and also some differences exist in terms of the gate driving. Of course the gate driver circuits, especially with high side devices which are on a floating uh, voltage level, these uh, gate drivers need to be able to uh, handle high DVDTs and also the gate driving voltages of many of today's silicon carbide MOSFETs are slightly different to, to IGBTs so some adaptions in the gate driving circuit also need to be t considered. This is a very difficult question because you, um, a lot of power, con power um, conversion systems and consumer electronics are very low power systems, usually interfacing to the single phase grid. Um, so, and these are also extremely cost sensitive applications where um, of course efficiency and size are important but maybe not always the most important driving factors. So. Um, we will see how, what kind of role silicon carbide will play here, but in, uh, in the future personally I could see also gallium nitride as a very uh, likely candidate for this application area. Well, um, of course it is important to consider packaging for any kind of very fast switching power semiconductor. Whether it's a very fast superjunction MOSFET or a silicon carbide MOSFET or um, and the main problem is not so much the packing material, but actually the structure of the package uh, and the parasitics, as, as rightly pointed out. Of course, um, excessive um, parasitic inductances in particular limit the amount of switching speed that is possible without violating the um, breakdown voltage specification of the devices. So yes, it is very important that packages also are addressing the capabilities of the device packaged within them. Um, one step that Rome is taking in this direction is uh, in the near future to also release new devices in uh, TO247 4 lead package where a, an additional pin is provided as a driving source. This helps to uh, increase the turn-on speed by overcoming some issues uh, which can be um, a problem because in three pin devices the relatively large uh, source inductance is traditionally shared by the power loop and by the gate drive loop. And also, um, we are also working on an SMD version of our packages, which will be a D2-PAC 7 lead. 
and this also has a driving source pin to help with the turn on speed and in addition the package has an overall much lower um, stray inductance than a traditional 3-pin TO style package so this of course also helps the um, turn off speed to be high without causing over voltages. That's a good question. I would say um, maybe. Uh, I would say we now have about 19 years of experience working with this material, so it's probably not that alien to us anymore. Uh, our first R&D activity started around 2000 with this new material and uh, we have learned a lot since then and um, you, you will see also when you look at our product lineup uh, where there is quite a number of devices uh, on offer now that we, we, we seem to have understood quite well what is necessary to um, use this material to, to build reliable and robust devices. Um, also the fact that within the Rome group with the company Cycrystal we also have a manufacturer of silicon carbide base material. I think that also helped us to uh, make this less alien to us. Of course the automotive market is of very high interest to us and if you look at our lineup you will also see that a significant amount of silicon carbide devices are available in automotive uh, graded versions. And um, speaking about more electric vehicles, um, there are many applications within these vehicles which can be addressed by silicon carbide power devices such as onboard chargers which we've already spoken about previously where silicon carbide diodes and increasingly also MOSFET are already being used, but also DC-DC converters to interface high voltage systems to low voltage systems. And of course the main drive inverter which basically um, interfaces the battery to the um, electric motor propelling the vehicle and also recuperating energy uh, when the vehicle slows down. And uh, all these devices um, can uh, in principle be used in, in all these different applications and our colleagues are in contact with the leading um, players in the automotive industry to also ensure that our future devices meet with the future needs of this, this large industry. Um, and one area where we've been able to gain uh, further experience with this is our technological uh, sponsorship and also cooperation with the Formula E racing team of Venturi which we've been working with over the last years, um, supplying silicon carbide modules to be used in the main drive inverter of a high power racing car. Yes, it is possible in many situations to um, replace uh, a silicon IGBT with a silicon carbide MOSFET. Of course, you need to make sure that um, things like the gate driver are being adapted to make sure that in all kinds of operating conditions the safe operating areas of the devices are not violated, especially because the silicon carbide MOSFET can of course turn on and off very fast. You need to make sure that overshoots uh, stay within the boundaries set for your system and also for the device. So some adaptations on gate drive level are usually necessary. Um, however, it should always be considered that you want to make the full use of the capability that the silicon carbide MOSFET offers. So in many situations it might be better to um, actually look at the system demands and how they can be optimally addressed using a silicon carbide MOSFET or, and or a diode based converter and then compare such an optimized solution with the already existing optimized silicon based solution because if you fully uh, utilize all the features of the silicon carbide devices you may gain a, a substantially bigger benefit than by just replacing one on one um, a silicon device by a silicon carbide device. This always depends on how many devices you put in parallel, what the circuit layout looks like. So um, it is generally a good idea to start with a small gate uh, resistance for each of them, uh, each of the MOSFETs in the region of maybe 1 to 3 ohms and see where this leads you. Depending on the layout it may be necessary to increase this gate resistance so there is no definite answer but we always you need to consider that um, the layout is as symmetrical as possible so uh, all devices um, carry an equal share of the current because otherwise you need to start derating um, and need more, you need more devices than you would under ideal conditions. <laughs>
Um, this is something that happens because of a consequence of the internal capacitance uh, to a, to a MOSFET, basically any MOSFET. So if you imagine that you have a half bridge consisting of two silicon carbide MOSFETs and you're turning on and off the low side MOSFET, effectively the source potential of the high side MOSFET is jumping up and down. Um, and this uh, causes also a DVDT across the device, um, hence there um, is a displacement current through the Miller capacitance which can be seen as a positive or negative spike on the gate of the device which should be off at this time. Um, and to mitigate this you can work for example with a gate driver that supports active Miller clamping to make sure that the gate is always um, maintained at the desired off voltage to avoid parasitic turn on which would occur if you have too high spikes on the gate or to avoid violating the specification of the device if your peaks go too low. Um, basically you can take different measures. One measure is to use a gate driver which supports active Miller clamping and thereby provides a low impedance pass between gate and source while the device is maintained off. Uh, other options can include a small capacitance on the gate for example to provide some local buffering uh, to avoid either positive or negative peaks. Um, actually, these recommended values depend on the generation of MOSFETs that you're using. So if you're using a second generation MOSFET, we recommend plus 18 and minus 2. Whereas if you use a third generation device, uh, it is recommended to turn off the device with 0 volts while maintaining 18 volts as the turn on voltage. And what would happen if you were to deviate from these recommendations? Um, primarily if you change the on voltage, so the 18 volt which is recommended for both generations to for example a voltage of 15 volts, um, this was, would cause the RDS on of the device to increase so you would not get the full performance out of the, of, of the chip and also you need to be careful not to go significantly below 40, 15 or 14 volts uh, to make sure that the temperature coefficient always is favorable and to avoid any um, thermal runaway issues which can happen if you go below 14 volts on the gate. Um, whereas if you deviate from the turn-off voltage a recommendation of zero volts for the third generation for example you always need to make sure that um, you still meet the specification of the device in the data sheet we give certain uh, limits for what kind of voltage you may not exceed on the gate to ensure the long-term robustness of the device and this you need to make sure especially uh, in any design but uh, especially if you move away from the recommended zero, zero volt turn off volt. Not necessarily, as I said to the previous question for the third generation devices, we actually recommend to turn off zero volt in many cases. And uh, if you look at the threshold voltage specified in the data sheet, turning off a zero volt in many cases is sufficient. However, we do also recommend that you use active Miller clamping to ensure that there is always a, a low impedance pass between the gate and the source while the MOSFET is supposed to be turned off completely and to avoid any issues which could otherwise arise with um, a parasitic turn on, for example, in a half bridge configuration.